Hey, good evening, popular astronomers, and welcome to Pop Astro Live. If you're watching live, it's Thursday, the 12th of August. If you aren't watching live, it could be any date between here and infinity. So please start sharing the stream. It helps immensely with our algorithms. I shall play our little 30 second countdown while people join the stream. And in the meanwhile, hit the share button. It will be most appreciated. Oh, let's have your comments. Say hello, everybody. Who are you and where are you calling from? And we are off. How is it going, popular astronomers? I'm sure the comments are already flooding in. This is Pop Astro Live. It is the show for stargazers of all levels. And we must say hello, Mr. Roberts in South London. Good evening. You are watching next week. It was a great show, wasn't it, Paul? Hello from the future. How is it there? I hear it's absolutely dystopian. So please, uh, if you are the time traveller that you claim to be, please tell us what it's like in the future. Thank you very much. Um, um, okay. Ah, oh, I've got some terrible news for you. Plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug. It's completely gone missing. I think it's because I broadcast from a different room uh, the other night and uh, the mug has vanished. I suspect it's on the other side of the garden and it's so windy that I'm not going back out there. My hair was like a dandelion clock getting blown today. But... We're going to have some more fun because the great powers that be, bless them, at the SPA have given me written permission, no less, i.e. Paul Sutherland, emailed it to me and said, I have got permission to choose a new mug. So I thought you might like to help me choose a new mug. Should we do it right now? I'm going to show them on the screen. And um, the most popular one from the Pop Astro shop gets to choose me a mug. Um, share screen. Let's have a look. Oh no, where's it gone? I had this all sorted just before we came on. Just bear with me, shop. Oh, now I've got to scroll through and look for the mugs. Where have they gone? I think they're on here. When I go away from my computer, it all seems to just reset. That's my excuse anyway. Bear with me. I know the mugs are on here somewhere. Here they are. Right. Okay. Which one should we get? How's the sharing on the screen? What? Something went wrong. No, 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 no. Uh, right, okay, so the choice of mugs that we have got from the Pop Astro shop are Astronomy is Looking Up mug. I'm quite partial to a cuppa mug. I've got stars in my eyes. I know Sonia Turkington, our weather presenter, has got that one. She's very partial to that because we like that kind of... Um, thing thing that's on it the spa kind of stargazing logo then we have got on the next page oh that's the one i've got the gear model the basic one i'm too hot to handle sun mug i make my drinks the milky way it's time to mug up on mars oh god there's loads more look oh do you know i'm quite partial to stirry stirry night that's my favorite or an astronomy is just my cup of tea what's that constellation is it the kettle <laughs> it's the um, I can't remember what it's called now. I'm sure it's called the Morphe Richards Kettle. And I'm just going through a phase. So let me know which one I should get. Favorite ones in the comments. Uh let's have a look what we've got here. Uh you should I should what? Get the sun because I'm a ray of sunshine. That's very sweet of you, Jed. You will not get a free mug with nice comments like that. It's the teapot. Thank you, Paul. I knew it was. Tea for two. Fancy doing tea, Paul. Not the kettle at all. Hi, Vicky and SPAers. Looking forward to Ian's talk. If you aren't a member, join in. It's cheap as chips at £23. And I don't even have to have a fake tan like David Dickinson. Um, okay. Well, the um good evening, Vicky. For a moment, I thought it wasn't on tonight. Evening, all evening, Bob. The teapot asterism. Good name for a band, yeah. Right. 
let me just get rid of the screen share. There we go. I'm back in my full frontal glory. We've got a Cosmo plot twist coming soon. Um, okay, so this evening it is Pop Astro Live. We have got the pointless constellation hunt, although I'm sure astronomer, journalist and writer Ian Ribpath wouldn't like to hear his presentation about obsolete constellations being called the pointless constellation hunt. Um, it was just me attempting to be a little bit clickbaity, so it's not pointless at all. Okay, so taking us on the no-show journey around the sky will be Ian Ribpath. Uh, we are also gearing up for the peak of the Perseids meteor shower. Did you see one? I went outside to uh, water the garden last night, shall we say, at um, probably about 3am. And I saw one! I saw one! Yes. So make sure you've got plenty of wishes lined up. Um, I made a wish. It'd be rude not to, really, wouldn't it? So on the show tonight, we have got Eleni with the Space News. Now, Sonia has got a terms and conditions apply tonight. Sonia isn't going to be doing a presentation. She is setting up her copious gear to film the Perseids and to shoot them from uh, her back garden in Stockport. But she might be going to Argos to get a piece of kit. So Sonia might join us. Sonia might not. Let us see what happens. It's all very very tense as to whether Sonia is going to be joining us. Cosmo the telescope sloth might be pestering and mithering us and getting in the way. He's had a very adventurous week. He's been spaghettified in a black hole, tunnelled into the centre of the Earth and fallen into Jupiter's red spot. So he has been a little bit worse wear this week. Nothing a boil wash won't sort out, though. 90 degree wash. But can you guess where else he's been? And actually, there's a major Cosmo plot twist. Fans of Cosmo, do keep on watching. So we are now going to go over on to our wonderful... Oh, we've got comments. Let's have a quick look at them. Are constellations below the horizon pointless? Not if you live below the horizon. Oh, hello, new round of Nautic friend. Bonjour. Ça va? Uh, good evening. Hi, Adrian. All the regulars. Should have been as cheap as chips. You spelt cheap wrong, mate. Oh, I'm turning into one of those people who corrects people. So, hello, Sean. Were you our new viewer last week? I seem to seem to recall you were. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll I'll display all your typos and corrections as well. I'll do that. Uh, right, we're going to get Ian Ribpath on now. Coming to you in three, two, one, Ian. Be prepared. Hello, love. Hello. Hi, Ian. Are you all right? Yeah, I feel a bit naughty calling your lovely presentation the Pointless Constellation Hunt, but I wanted it to kind of convey a sense of fun and possibly be a little bit clickbaity as well. So, of course, it's not pointless because I know that you are very well up on your astronomical history and you're going to give us a great little lesson tonight. I hope so. Well, yes, they are pointless because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, as I think one of the basic statistics everyone should know is that there are 88 constellations which cover the entire sky. Uh, but it was only 100 years ago that the International Astronomical Union, when it was first formed, decided on those 88 constellations. And if you go back a couple of hundred years, it seems that every time someone made a new map or a new atlas, they try and, and fit in some new little constellation of their own invention to, to sort of, you know, immortalize themselves in the sky uh, but most of those ideas never caught on but tonight i want to have a look at, at some of those rejects some are quite fun some really quite surprising and one or two actually came came close to being adopted but um i'm, I'm going to need to go and and share my screen can i do that just by clicking the share button Yes, you can. Yeah, the um, universe does have a have a habit of imploding down its own wormhole when you do this. So you have been um, warned. Let's have a look. Um, e, uh, no, that's not the one I want. I want no, 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 no. No, that no, one. No. That one. There we are. Hey, it's there. There we are. The amazing vanishing constellations. They're not pointless, but they were they were vanishing. Ian, just um, before we go on, I'm going to tax you here now because we are coming up to the peak of the Perseids. Do you think after you've done this, you might be able to give us a little bit on the Perseids? Well, I haven't seen any myself this year because it was thoroughly cloudy and really rather wet overnight. But oh. um, if if you want to go out and, and have a look, well, we can talk about those, those yes. 
later. Anyway, so what we'll, what we'll do, we'll we'll go through your little presentation, then we'll have a little five minutes, and so you can prepare yourself, and then just give a couple more minutes on the Perseids if that's okay. All right, okay. Um, yeah, look, so, here we go. Okay. Here it is. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to have a look at some of these constellations that no longer exist, but which were suggested by various people. Um, and first off is one that was really a sub constellation. And, and by that, um, it means it was part of a larger constellation, but was still regarded as a figure in its own right. So there we go. The amazing vanishing constellations. And here we have Perseus and the head of Medusa. And oh, it's here. a very dark. It's a very dark night there, Ian. Because there's absolutely Sorry? nothing. On the, it's a very dark night because there's nothing on the screen. But, oh, you can't see my. Oh dear. Um, ah. It did come up originally. Do you want to try? Um, I'll I'll ditch it from the. Let, the let's, oh, let's it's here now. Let's it's there. Again. Right. Can you see my amazing vanishing constellation slide? It has just completely vanished. Uh huh. Um, well, in that case, we might as well go straight to the Perseids, mightn't we? Um, well, there, there it is. We can see it there. You can see it there, but not, not when it's. Ah, hold on. Um, I'm sharing an application window. This is why it's always good to have a rehearsal. You know, you can't see it, it is, there. It? I just took it for granted that. Um, yeah, I know, Eleni. What do you press? Is it are you on PowerPoint there? Maybe I'll try the present. Has it got present rather than play? Uh, it's worked before. It sure has. I told you, it makes the universe disappear inside itself. Um, what about, is there a present? I just don't know. Will it be, it, or, um, I don't know, IT Live, my favourite thing to show people. Oh, Ellen is here. Let's have a look. She might have a. Yes, you can you do try putting it into slideshow? Is there that option on it? Um, Ooh. well, I'm just doing a play. Um, sorry, everyone, it's okay. I'll entertain the troops. Hello, my darling. Hello, <laughs> no, we it worked before when it, we did our um, the, the, the Google Doodles, which actually worked. Mm -hmm. I worked that up into a little article, which is in the, the latest. Sky at Night magazine. We haven't oh, looked nice. hard to find it. Yes, we have to look hard to find it. But they've also got it online. Um, all right. So, well, if it's not showing up, mm. you, you can't see that. Try scrolling through a few slides. No, it just keeps doing that, doesn't it? Uh, so that that you're not seeing that. No, I guess just do it as it is like that. It's fine. People can borrow, but deal with a bit of a uh, uh, border. All right. Um, okay. So as I said, the first first one was the um, uh, Kappa, the head of Medusa, Kappa Medusa, it was called. And this uh, actually comes from, this is a card from uh, Urania's Mirror which was a set of constellation cards with holes punched in to show you the various stars. And you can sh see that it's actually headed Perseus and Caput Medusae. And there's Perseus with his uh, sword, with, uh, with you know, bloodstained sword, because he's just cut off the head of Medusa the Gorgon, who was this evil creature who's, who had snakes for hair and whose gaze could turn living things into stone. Um, but quite a number of, of old star charts, if you go back and look, named Caput Medusa as a separate figure. It's now regarded as part of Perseus, but it was once regarded as, as a separate figure. But there's something here I want to draw your attention to, um, and that is the star Algol, because Algol is in the head of Medusa, and Algol is one of the most famous variable stars of all. It's an eclipsing binary star. Um, now, a lot of people think that Algol marks the winking eye of Medusa, but it doesn't. As you can see, it's the artist has shown it here in the forehead, not on the eye at all. Now, you might think, well, has the artist made a mistake? Did they get it wrong? But no. If we look at uh, the Atlas of John Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal, he had Algol in the forehead. And Johann Bode, the German, who made 
the, the, the wonderful star atlas called Uranographia, which is, is my favorite, he also shows it right up there in the hair. So you can see these various uh, old star atlases did not show Algol as being the eye of the Gorgon. What about the Arabs? Well, the Arabs actually showed it to the side of the head there. This is from um, a, an Arab astronomer of about a thousand years ago called Al Sufi, who produced an updated version of the Almagest. So even the Arabs didn't think of it as the, the winking eye. So it, it really seems that the idea of Algol um, being the eye of the demon and, and the Greeks or the Arabs having known of its variability just isn't true. It's a modern myth, but I just don't know where this idea started. Um, Ptolemy himself, who, who wrote the Almagest back in 150 AD, he just called Algol the bright star in the head, and that's where it's always been shown. So, so don't think that the ancient Greeks and Arabs knew about Algol's variability. That It's not supposed to be the eye, it's just the star in the head. All right, well, let's move on to some constellations which have now completely gone. I hope you're still following me on this, are you? We're all still avid on this. It's an amazing right, thing. Okay. They remind now, me of, um, do you ever get those puzzle books with like really intricate dot to dots in? No, probably yeah. not. They're all... <laughs> and they, they have that many dots in them. And it's not until you get in right near the end that you can actually figure out what the heck it's supposed to be. Hmm. Mm. Well, I mean, all these things, any, almost all constellations require a fair bit of imagination. You know, Leo the lion is probably one of the ones that really does look like what it's supposed to represent, as does Scorpius the scorpion. But, you know, th there are a number of, of, of little gaps in between the, the better known figures. Um, and this was one, because I mean, during the, the, we're going back now to the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and there was a move then away from naming constellations after the creatures and characters from the old Greek myths. And they started naming them, naming them after scientific instruments and inventions of the day. And it was in 1798, there was a French astronomer called Joseph Lalande, and he came up with this wonderful idea called Globus Aerostaticus. Um, it was supposed to honor the hot air balloon invented by the Montgolfier brothers. Now, Lalonde provided a lot of star positions to the German astronomer Johann Bode for the star atlas that Bode produced, called the Uranographia. And Lalonde suggested that he should be allowed to name a new constellation celebrating this great French invention of the hot air balloon. Well, Bode agreed, and he put it in his atlas, and which is where this illustration comes from. And he, he, you can see it floating aloft next to the tail of the southern fish on the left, um, and appearing to almost appearing to lift up Capricornus, which lies above it. Now, Abode did a deal. He said, in return, that he should be allowed to invent a constellation celebrating a great German invention. And so, the, what he came up with was this new constellation. The printing shop, Officina <laughs> Typographica. And this commemorated <laughs> Gutenberg's invention of printing. And this again is it on Bode's own atlas, squeezed in next to the head of Canis Major, the, the great dog on the right there. Now, you might think that this you know, it ought to look like a printing press. It doesn't look like a printing press because it isn't a printing press. What Bode showed here was a tray full of type. Here we are. And there are pads here for inking the type and a frame in which the paper is held. And the press itself, for whatever reason, Bode didn't include that in the constellation. But here's uh, an illustration <clears throat> from uh, around about that time showing what actually happened in printers' workshops in those days. And on the left of the picture there on top of that, that set of drawers is the tray of type. And that was called a case. And at the top of the case were the capital letters and at the bottom of the case were the normal letters. And that's how the terms uppercase and lowercase came about. Oh, yeah. yeah, see, capitals and little ones, uppercase and lowercase, from, from because they're in different parts of the typecase. But on the right, you can see there's a man with two pads inking the type. Well, the man next to him is taking out a printed page from a frame and putting some fresh paper into it. And then they'd put the frame into the press itself, which is off to the right of the picture, to press the ink type against the paper. 
Now, that's what Boda was trying to show in his illustration. And I think you could argue that the printing press certainly had a far more of an effect on civilization than, than the hot air balloon. Um, and really, it might have been worth keeping. But uh, in the end, neither Lalonde's balloon nor Bode's printing shop survived. Now, this one was invented in, 90, in 1777 by a Polish astronomer called Martin Pokczebut. I hope I got that right for the, the Polish uh, astronomers who are listening. And this incorporated a little V-shaped group of stars near the shoulder of a fucus. And I'll just uh, zoom in on that. Now, Pokczebut thought this little V-shaped group of stars looked like a smaller version of the Hyades, which mark the face of Taurus the bull in, in the zodiac, the one we all know about. So he turned this area into a little constellation to honor his king, Stanislav Poniatowski, since the bull was a feature of the king's coat of arms. And here's Poniatowski's bull. It looks rather tangled up with the tail of serpents. Again, this is on one of the cards from Urania's mirror. But the king's bull didn't last for long, but you, you, you can't sort of just go around naming things after kings just to flatter them but the little group of stars like a mini Hyades that makes up the bull's face it's quite an attractive feature and it's actually worth looking out for near the shoulder of a fucus the serpent bearer now we got two for the price of one here no here we are that's it two that was two for the price of one here we've got they're both near the celestial pole and they're both French constellations. And the French seem to invent quite a lot of constellations that <laughs> ultimately got the boot. That's perhaps they were the Wellington boot. And here they both are. They're above Camilla Pardalis, the giraffe, which is a real constellation, although you might not, it's quite faint, you might not notice it. But we'll take a closer look at these. And they're called, well, the first one here is called the reindeer. And that makes sense, being near the pole, Arctic, uh, Arctic reindeer. And it was known by a couple of different names. Here it's called Tarandus, although it was also known as Rangifa. And both those names come from the reindeer's scientific name, which is Rangifa Tarandus. And the reindeer was suggested... Um, Rangifa Tarandus. Yeah, look it up. Now, the reindeer was suggested in 1743 by a Frenchman called Pierre Lemonnier, and he put it there as a reminder of his trip to Lapland, which is in uh, the north of Scandinavia. Um, and he went up there as part of an expedition to measure the length of a degree of latitude in the far north to, to understand the proper shape of the Earth. Now, the other constellation is just to the right of it, which you can see it's called Custos Messium. And... This that one is also suggested by Lalonde, um, who we saw suggested the uh, the hot air balloon. He's he's comes up with some more as well later on. And Custos Messium in Latin means the guardian of the harvest. So he's shown as a rather rustic figure with a scythe and a shepherd's crook in his hand. But the name is also meant to refer to Charles Messier, the famous French comet hunter. And in France, this constellation was often known simply as Messier, Castos Messium. And you can see on the chart here that it lay between uh, Cepheus to the top and Camelo Pardalis, but it never caught on. Um, and the stars of Castos Messium have now been returned to Cassiopeia. So there was a, a reindeer, at least. I thought it would have made sense, I think, to have had a reindeer up there, but neither that or... Custos Messium have survived. Now, I expect you, you may know there's a southern constellation called Telescopium, which represents an old-fashioned refracting telescope. But for a while, there was a second telescope in the sky, which is called Telescopium Herschelii, which commemorated William Herschel's telescope, which he discovered the planet Uranus in 1781. And this constellation was invented by Johann Bode, who was a fellow German. Herschel, of course, was German in origin. And Bode had bought telescopes made by Herschel, and he knew what they looked like. And this is an accurate representation of the portable six-inch reflector that Herschel used for discovering Uranus. And Bode showed it on his giant atlas called Uranographia, which he published in 1801, just 20 years 
after the discovery of Uranus. And it was crammed in next to Auriga the charioteer and just north of Gemini, but it didn't really work and there wasn't really need for a second constellation commemorating a telescope, so it quietly died. Now this one I really wish had survived. It's Felix the cat. Yeah. Um, and, and this, yes, it's another of those inventions of Lalonde, the Frenchman, and he suggested it like the, 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 the previous ones. He suggested it to Bode, who added it to his big star atlas. But this picture comes from one of those cards from Urania's Mirror, which came out about 20 years after Bode's original atlas was published. And the cat is in the southern hemisphere under one of the coils of Hydra, which is that green snaky thing you can see above it. Now, Lalonde was a great cat lover, and um, by then he was getting on in, in years, he was in his late 60s, and he'd been observing the sky all his life, and he said he was getting pretty tired with it by then, and he thought he'd have a bit of fun by adding the cat. Um, and it's coloured here on the Urania's Mirror card as a calico cat with three colours, so it must be a female. Now, I don't know what Lalonde intended the, uh, the cat to be, but... Um, on its original on Bode's atlas, it was only in black and white. And, and this is Bode's original representation, which I think is terrible. I mean, what does it look like to you? I think it looks more like a rabbit. Oh, I don't know. I would be scared if I saw one in my bath, though. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it doesn't look much like a cat. So whoever engraved this, I don't think, was a particular cat lover. So, anyway, <laughs> Lalonde, Lalonde quite literally put the cat out at night. But other astronomers either didn't like cats so much or they thought Lalonde was being too frivolous. So it was dropped. Ah, somebody killed the cat. Considering how astronomers seem to have an affinity with cats, that is just such an oddball that probably every constellation in the sky isn't a cat. Because I know astronomers <laughs> love their cats. What is the affinity? Do you like cats, Ian? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, my, my partner Sheila and I, we have... A rather naughty Burmese. He's called Perseus, or uh, Percy for short. Yeah, but uh, he he flies through the air with the greatest of ease, and so we named him Perseus. Now, there's there's one act, one happy footnote to this that um, the brightest star in what was this old constellation has now been officially named Felis by the International Astronomical Union. But I say brightest star, but unfortunately, it's only fifth magnitude, so you'll need binoculars to spot it and that was really the main problem with all these uh, old constellations that, that we're talking about tonight they're all faint and they all pinch stars from other constellations and as the these constellations have been abandoned they've had to hand them back but now we're getting close to the end here but here's one vanished constellation you'll almost certainly have heard of because its name lives on in the quadranted meteor shower and it's called Quadrans Muralis, the wall-mounted quadrant. And it lies just above the head of Bootes, near the handle of the plough. And that's yeah. where the radiant of the Quadrantids lies. Now, it's another invention by Lalonde, the Frenchman. And it commemorates the instrument that he used for, for taking star positions at his observatory in Paris. Um, and this is it on Bode's Atlas. Now, given that there's a major annual meteor shower named after it, I don't know why this one didn't survive. You'd have thought there'd be a good reason to keep it. But, um, but again, it was very faint, and it was considered surplus to requirements, and, and the IAU dropped it when they rationalised the constellations in the 1920s. Now, finally really finally i'm going to end with one another sub constellation and this one nearly did make it to the final selection because its origin goes all the way back to ptolemy in the second century a.d and in the star catalog in his great book the almagest ptolemy listed antinous as a subdivision of aquila the eagle it's another sub constellation now antinous was a real person and here he's shown on another, another of the cards from Uranio's mirror. He's shown here as a rather beautiful young man being carried off by the eagle. Curly locks and all that, and rather pouting lips. But who was Antinous? Well, he was the teenage boyfriend of the Emperor Hadrian. And Hadrian, I hope the world is ready to know about this, but Hadrian was the first openly gay Roman emperor.
And he's said to have met this boy during a visit to Turkey, which was then a Roman province. And Hadrian took a fancy to the boy and he groomed him to become his constant companion. But tragedy intervened. During a boat trip along the Nile in AD 130, Antinous fell overboard and drowned, although some people say he actually jumped deliberately. But whatever the case, Hadrian was heartbroken and he wanted him commemorated among the stars. Now, Ptolemy, the astronomer, worked at Alexandria at the mouth of the Nile, the, the, not far from where the famous drowning occurred, and he compiled his star catalogue in the Almagest about 20 years after the famous drowning. So he'd have known the story, and he might well have had a hand in creating this constellation, perhaps at the Emperor Hadrian's request. So Antinous was what you might call a gay icon, and you can find him on star charts right through to the Victorian era, when I suppose perhaps they weren't quite so keen on gay icons. So there we are. That's the full shocking truth of how the boyfriend of a gay Roman emperor nearly ended up among the stars. And if you want to mo know more about um, the ones I've been talking about or any of the constellations, then please Google my Star Tales pages and you'll find loads about all these constellations, uh, in, including a couple of dozen uh, of the obsolete ones. So there we are. If we can now, perhaps I can hope I can now go back to my, Enid, that was um, a lovely constellator, a lovely presentation, and so much stuff there that I'd never even heard of. So, I did, do we have any comments? Any questions? Yes, we from? have. Uh, we had loads actually going through. I've displayed them all. I'd just like to apologise if my internet's a bit crinkly tonight. It's because uh, we've got lots of other users on the system tonight. So, um, uh, Alan says, that giraffe is freaking me out. <laughs> the giraffe? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a real consolation. That one survived. Um, and then um, great imagination to create a reindeer with two stars. That's quite amusing. Yeah, yeah. There weren't many naked eye stars. They tend to be fifth, sixth magnitude because no, they were really scraping the barrel in some areas. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Yeah, lovely, lovely. And I'm sure the comments will keep on coming in. Right, we're just going to have a couple of minutes. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind just coming back on for the um, uh, a little bit about the Perseids, please. I'm not sure if we're going to have Sonia tonight, our um, space weather lady, because she's on a mission to get her gear set up and also is buying, I think, a remote shutter possibly from um, Argos. She might be making a mercy dash for gear. So if that's all right, Ian, can we have you back on in just about three minutes? Sure, yes. I shall, uh, I shall we're be gonna here. Have a, we're going to have a musical interlude. Okay. Great stuff. Keep all the comments coming. I would like to know your best Perseids memory. Inevitably, when you are gazing at the Perseids, you are going to be somewhere beautiful and dark. You're not going to be um, alongside the M1 in a traffic jam. You're going to be somewhere fantastic with fantastic company, fantastic friends, very, very potent memories of the Perseids. So drop it in the comments. Let's evoke some memories, shall we? What does this comment say here? Um, many thanks, Ian, for the nice illustrations. They were very good. Alan would like to add a forklift. I'm afraid you're going to have to consult the International Astronomy Union for that. And in the meanwhile, yes, John, hi. Yes, that was very interesting. So much stuff to learn there. Right. Guess what we've got? A musical interlude. By the way, I mean, I can't tell whether my internet is poor tonight, but if it is, it will clear up at the end of August when all the kids go home from the summer holidays because we're on communal Wi-Fi on the holiday park here. Are you ready for some music? Now, um, I've been a bit hit and miss with my space songs lately, um, and that's because I've been making them songs for other projects. I can only do one a week. They blow my brain. And there's a lot of layers goes into them. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is because they're relatively short, that I would dig out some raves from the grave and play a couple of ones from months gone by and i thought if repeats are good enough for the bbc i'm looking at you only fools and horses it's all right for me to dig up a couple of space songs that i wrote from a while ago and the one of the ones that's really stuck in my head is the song about 
the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, which is the graph that astronomers use to gauge the temperature, mass, luminosity of stars. So, are you ready for it? I'm going to play it right now. Let's get rid of all these banners. In the meanwhile, hit us with all your best Perseids memories. And uh, when we come back, we'll have more of Ian on how to watch the Perseids Cosmo plot twist and uh, Eleni and maybe Sonia, if we're really lucky. OK, here it comes. The Hertzsprung Russell song. Are you having a laugh? I gotta sing about a graph. Okay, challenge accepted. The diagram is called the Russell. It's all about stars, their brightness and their muscles. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Oh, be a fine guy, kiss me. And stars don't age like humans. They go wiggly, wiggly, horizontal we've got temperature and on the vertical luminosity twinkle twinkle bright blue star how i wonder how hot you are and thank the accuracy of science for predicting the brightness of red giants Most of the stars are on the main sequence. They can off and become a giant. If you want to know more about balls of gas, temperature and age, luminosity, mass, I get to know Hertz from Russell and all of their graphs, and I promise you'll lace your astronomy class. Guess what? Sonia's in the green room. So we're going to have Eleni, Ian, Eleni, Cosmo, Sonia. So back to Ian now. Hi, Ian. I'm coming back to you now. Hello. Was that really you? Yes. Jane McDonald has really got a lot to worry about now, hasn't she? <laughs> oh, my God. Can I do some astronomy cruises, please? Northern Lights cruises. <laughs> I'll, be the resident, I'll be the resident astronomy cruise entertainer how about that well, well, that's oh yes very entertaining very entertaining Thank but it you. but it, it'll it'll never replace the element song tom lehrer's element song do you know tom oh, lehrer's I'll, element song i'll have to google that one. Oh, you don't know tom lehrer's no, element know. song he no, put the entire periodic table to music Oh really? All oh, right, right. Well, I'll I'll do the periodic table backwards if he's done it forwards. I've just got to well, say here, nothing to do with astronomy, but you're looking very lovely tonight. Do you know why? It's because I've got a new top on from the charity shop that was three quid. Turns out, brand new. I looked at the label. It was from Ethel Austin, which is a defunct shop to match your defunct constellations. And I've also done a Kim Kardashian makeup tutorial, and I think that's why I look like a Kardashian with a mop of curly hair tonight. So. Oh, Just take a compliment, yes. Vicky. Ian, uh, yes, there's no, there's no daylight. It's, it's clear out tonight. It wasn't last night. So I'm in West London. Right. Um, all the weather forecasts seem to have gone completely wrong over the past couple <laughs> of days. Um, so it's, an, you know, it's probably completely different wherever you are. But the prospects look good. I mean, I'm in West London, so it really is a terrible place for trying to observe the sky. But as you know, that the uh, the, the Perseids are reaching a peak sometime tonight or tomorrow morning, and you'll have to look towards the, the northeast under Cassiopeia to see Perseus rising. Unfortunately, it, the radiant doesn't really get high enough to see a lot of Perseids until well after 11. So you do have to stay up late. This is one thing they don't tell you about the Perseids, that you really have to stay up late. So if you have to get up early tomorrow morning, it's not really a, uh, an ideal meteor shower to observe. But normally, normally the, the, it's beautiful and warm and, you, and you're having a barbecue and you want to lie out in the open on a uh, on an August evening, it's not like that tonight. It's really rather chilly, 
but it will go on until dawn. There should be some more tomorrow night as well, but it'll go on until dawn. And as the radiant gets higher, the numbers get greater. And what I like to do is to either lie flat on the on on the grass on something warm you know you need a sleeping bag or the best way to observe is really get a deck chair out this is when your neighbors are convinced that astronomers are mad and they see you lying out in the deck chair in the middle of the night but if you look overhead you can you'll be able to see cygnus the swan and i always with the milky way fly running through it and i always love seeing really bright perseids flashing along the milky way through the the length of cygnus the swan <laughs> and hello who have we got Hi. here ian this is sonia and I, i've just saw the message from her that says can i pop on quickly i'm going to photo the moon before it sets so um I what, just what's the cat no I, I want to know about the cat <laughs> oh that's that's the neighbor's cat he just they, they like they wander in so pop pop come here pop see love so this is bob Oh. There we go. We need more more astro cats. We had Katie in earlier. She's the one that likes to have cuddles and picked up, but she's she's out somewhere now. What sort so, of she? Um, we've got a we've got a Burmese. It loves cuddles yeah. and and tummy rubs. So, Ian, thank you so much. Um, um, I'm going to nip to Sonia because I know that she's really eager to photograph the sight of the sky tonight. The whole running order of the show has just been thrown in the air. Like <laughs> in the air. Well, that's good because I am spontaneous, adaptive and agile. So, Ian, it's been a pleasure seeing you and come back on in a few more months. It'd be lovely to have you back on. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. Good night and goodbye. Bye. There we go, Sonia. You made it. Did you make your mercy dash for your equipment? This is not a cloud in the sky here, and the uh, the crescent moon is over there setting. Um, and then out the back way, I will have the per sides. So similar to what we have at the front window, the back window views north. The um, Cassiope is up there. Then we've got the plow in that direction. So the back window opens up and I get the whole view. So I'm going to sit on my phone tonight and I'm going to hope and try and do a time lapse of the, uh, the meteor shower. Are you, so, coming yes. back on? Are, we, are, we, are you coming back on, Sonia, or is that it from you this evening? That'll be it for me this evening. Oh. I need to charge my phone. I've got 5% battery life on my phone, which will, oh. the moon will take a lot of that. Up. Katie, come on. Oh, here's Katie. We were, talking, we were talking about cat constellations before, Sonia. Well, Sonia, look, we've already seen your lovely picture of the Perseid. You've had a great one already. Maybe next I week. Have. Show us the fruits of your labour, Sonia, and we'll miss you. Um, but at least we got to see you a little bit. I have. Here's Katie. Oh, she's really. I've met Katie. She's a beautiful, beautiful cat. She's lovely. Oh. Thanks for nipping in, Sonia, and good luck. Oh, you're welcome. So we can see mostly clear nights. It's probably going to be Scotland that may get some clouds, but it's looking absolutely brilliant for tonight. Not Ooh. sure about the rest of the week, but tonight is definitely, definitely going to be a good night. It's an absolutely lovely thin crescent moon out now. So waiting for Peter to get back it. from the shop, and then he can help me out with my job Dobsonian <laughs> to do some imaging oh. of a crescent moon. So they'll be up shortly on uh, probably Twitter and Facebook once I get those sorted. Oh, Sonia, you are my little sunshine, Sonia. I'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. She's so good, Sonia. She's just so committed to the cause. Right, let's have a look. We've got eight comments backing up here. Let's have a look. Yeah, hi, Sonia. She's gone, though. Um, um, oh, hi, Ray, the man whose email I've still not replied to. Tom Lehrer's Element song is their name sung to I am the very mother lover of Major General. At least my song was original. There are animations of it on the internet. Um, oh, yes, Sonia's satin images were lovely. She can't hear us. She's charging her phone up. Thank you for the viewing tips, Ian. Yeah, um, when I woke up last night to water the garden, it must I didn't check the time. It must have been, it was starting to get light. Cygnus had gone and the... Percy had came over from the north to the south pretty much. Does that sound right? It could have been a sporadic, but I don't think it was. You're a bit dazed and confused when you walk outside at 3 a.m. Hi, you forgot it was Thursday. What have you been doing all day, Steve Fractals, the man with a trillion faces and counting? You've got your lounger ready. 
That's a really nice way to do the Perseids. You know what, though? The Perseids mess up my body clock. Let me check my diary and see what I've got on tomorrow. It might be that I've got nothing on tomorrow. I can stay up late and mangle up my body clock. But I'm just seeing what it looks like here on Anglesey. It's so windy outside here. The red arrows over at RAF Valley, because it was um, a family fun day for the RAF Valley. The red arrows had to do a reduced display. They couldn't do all of their tight formation stuff because it was so darn windy today. Um, pouring with rain. I am so jealous. South of France is raining too. At least we don't feel so sad anymore and jealous of you, Alan. Okay, we are now going to go over to... Hang on a minute, I've gone off my script. What's on my script? Uh, we're going to go over to Eleni because she sat waiting patiently. I'm going to have a little break and then the Cosmo plot twist is coming. Um, you're just going to have to deal with it. Eleni, are you ready? Three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Hi, how Ooh, are you? I'm a bit dark. There we go. Uh, there we go. I, there we I, go. Do you know... I, the other day I bought a little light and it was only five pound. Tiny little light to sit on top of my computer. So um, I'll send That's you the link. Yeah, That's yeah the they got it. Yeah. The reason I look so radiant is because I've got a monster broadcasting light up here. It is huge, and that's why I oh, always just look right. radiant. I'm just borrowing my partner's light bulb um, <laughs> thing every time before the show, and I just plug it in. But it's a it's a fine art of turning and positioning it right so that not half of my face is dark and the other half is bright but i think it's okay now so you don't have a gibbous face <laughs> oh like my hands there that's not too bad but i don't think there i want go. to be presenting like that <laughs> <laughs> Eleni, are you good this week i'm fine thank you we will try to go and uh, see some Perseids after this. Um, are, your, so are, your, are your children behaving at school? Oh, schools are closed now, so oh, yay. <laughs> Happy <laughs> days. There's someone else's responsibility now from nine until three, not mine. Oh, my gosh. Right, Eleni, okay, <gasps> what's, your, what's your presentation on this evening then? Oh, we've got quite a few things for you. We've got, we've got some close-up things from Mars, some things from a little bit farther away, and another couple of interesting things you can look for in the night sky if you so please. Well, I'll let you crack on. And those craters look insanely beautiful. I know, right? So let me um, put that. That should be on full screen and now i'm gonna do my slideshow and it should be nice and big for everyone let's have a look it's not nice and big <laughs> oh god there we go yes nice and big perfect right. off you go so, this one so i've uh, recently managed to set up the um esa um subscription because i did it three times three times i got another so it took a while for some bizarre reason for the subscription to hold. <laughs> so I started getting um, daily bulletins and I got this amazing um, picture from, let's, I, I think I will pronounce this okay. It's an image taken by the Cassis camera on the ExoMars Trace gas orbiter. Um, and it's, it's, it's first of all artistically beautiful. You've got like uh, from uh, bigger to smaller in almost a perfect line and you have all the little craters uh, dotting around. And this is, um, as you might have guessed, a crater um, or three craters, if you want, in the surface, on the surface of Mars. And what's interesting about them is that um, you can actually see um, and I recently realized that when I move my mouse trying to show things to you, it doesn't actually show in the presentation. So <laughs> you can uh, probably use your uh, imagination a little bit and imagine there is a cursor going around. Uh, but you can see in the inner rims of the craters, um, there is um, varying um, 
levels of um, color change and texture change. And these are indicative of uh, different deposits of lava flows over the history of the existence of these craters. Um, and that could be extremely helpful in figuring out volcanic activity in Mars and, and its intricacies and how it has worked um, so far. So this is a very beautiful picture, um, very useful picture, and hopefully more pictures like that can help shed some light in um, uh, those lava flows and how they deposit, how, uh, when they happened, um, what they can tell us about Mars's volcanic activity. Um, and I thought I would share that with you because it's just beautiful. And as per my usual habit, I'm going to go from um, small to really, really big and far. And I'm going to go to this wonderful picture. Now, these are some huge rings that were actually pho photographed around the black hole. Um, why do we care? Why is that interesting? Well, first of all, circles, baby. Circles are amazing. Look at that. That's like perfect. It's like, you know, the accuracy is astonishing. Uh, but that's not scientifically important. <laughs> so this is located um, in V404 Cygni, um, which is a black hole. And there is, uh, it, it's actively accreting material. And what's happening here is a phenomenon which is known as light echoes. And they're similar to sound echoes, uh, but obviously with light waves. And um, what's happening is that there is um, X-rays essentially leaving the black hole. And they're getting um, bounced around. Uh, or bounced off from uh, dust clouds that are, the clouds that are between uh, V404 Cygni and Earth. And it kind of works the same way that you can um, echolocate something with uh, sound waves. In this scenario, you can echolocate these dust clouds um, with these light echoes. And I actually had never heard of that uh, before. It was the first time I heard about it myself. Um, the picture is a composite. Uh, the blue rings, they are X-rays, um, X-ray rings, uh, data coming from Chandra, which is an X-ray observatory. And then the stars, um, the background stars, um, they are uh, optical and infrared data coming from the Pan Stars Telescope in Hawaii. And they create this beautiful composite. And you might say, why, why is that interesting? Why do we want to know anything about um, some concentric rings around a black hole? Well, first of all, they can help us um, understand the distance of, of these dust clouds that they bounce off um, from the Earth. And they can also work as probes and help us understand uh, what these dust clouds are actually made of, uh, what type of dust, uh, what uh, um, composition and so on and so forth. So they can be quite useful and they, they do produce those um, very artistic um, images as well. Um, and that's my big um, part of the presentation. And then we're going to go to space news and weather. No auroras, unfortunately, it's a bit quiet, but there is a naked eye nova. And it's pretty cool. So um, it is 5,000 light years away in the constellation of Ophiuchus, which came up tonight as well, thanks, Ian. Um, and I was a little bit unsure of how to pronounce the word in English. Um, so I copy you, Ian. I hope that's OK. And What's happening here is that every 20 years or so, there is a um, thermonuclear explosion that happens on the surface of a white dwarf star. Um, and the white dwarf star is in the constellation of Yuhus. Um, and what is really happening is that this white dwarf star um, has a red giant as its companion, and it keeps sucking the life out of the red giant and takes material off of the red giant onto itself. 
And every couple of decades or so, there is enough material to actually ignite and um, create this thermonuclear explosion that can be actually visible with the naked eye. Um, so the last one was uh, uh, in 2006. And this one was a few days ago, a couple of days ago. And if you want to see it, you need to look south just after sunset. And it will be, uh, the constellation is close uh, to Scorpius and Sagittarius. And for those of you that are um, sharp-eyed, you can see it with the naked eye, uh, al although it's going to be really, really faint. But you will have a perfect um, chance of seeing it with binoculars. If you have a, a pair of binoculars, then go ahead and use them, because then you can actually see it. And be quick, because it's dimming rather fast. And I don't want to wait another 20 years to see it again. So I might try to see it tomorrow, um, see if I can catch it, if it's not cloudy. And finally, astronomy picture of the day. And I've been struggling lately because the astronomy pictures of the day do not fit my slide. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a little bit missing at the top and a little bit missing at the bottom. but the basic information that I want to convey through the image is actually all here, which is good. So this is the Trifid Nebula, and it's, it just looks like a rose, doesn't it? It's, it's very beautiful. Um, and unfortunately, it's not um, visible with the naked eye, um, but it actually is quite big on the night sky. It spans about uh, the same size, the same area as a full moon. So it's quite uh, big, but too faint. Um, however, using the right equipment, you can get stunning pictures like these ones. And what you can basically learn from a single picture is astonishing. Um, it actually is a great place to learn about three different types of um, nebulae. So you have a red structure, a red nebula, which is uh, light from um, hydrogen atoms being excited and emitting. Then in the background, which hopefully you can all see, there is this blue uh, glow, this blue part of the nebula that's actually reflected starlight. And then at the very front, you have those uh, dark structures, which are dust clouds, and they are actually obscuring um, light. So you have this um, three in one kind of deal with just one object in the night sky, which is um, really beautiful to look at and you can learn a lot from. Um, again, just as a reminder, the stars with the little crosses, remember these are stars in the foreground, okay? Not on galaxy in the foreground, and they appear having these um, crosses. Um, so that's that from me. I hope, as always, that that was informative and that um, you learned something you didn't know before and that you enjoyed it. As always, oh, hi, Cosmo. Did you learn anything tonight? Did he? Um, yes. <laughs> Cosmo's had a bit of a, a he's got a, well, we'll come to that in a minute, but there's a reason we've got this little character. Cosmo is nowhere to be seen. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. It's oh. the Cosmo portrait. Bob Jessamine, one of our wonderful regulars, says, thank you, Eleni, for sharing such superb images. Ah, oh, you're <laughs> welcome. You're welcome. I think astronomy um, is, is the science that lends itself um, in the most um, outreach, um, the most outreach opportunities. There's so much that people can see and learn from just a couple of images, and it's you know, enlightening. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's the most diverse science as well. Absolutely, it's the best one as well. Like, it is. Yeah. Question. I'm not biased. Well, maybe a little biased, but it is the best. Very good. Oh, Adrian, what a lovely comment. Always love Eleni's presentation. Oh, thank you very How much. Interesting. Oh, there you go. You've got a fan club, baby. Ah, they're all wonderful. Thank you for the lovely comments, everyone. Oh, Eleni, I'm sorry. In I've got so much to juggle with these shows. There's lots of buttons to press, and occasionally I do forget things, and guess what I forgot? What did you forget? Oh, my song. 
Eleni song. <laughs> Here it comes in the interest of consistency. Here she is with the space news. It's Eleni. It's Eleni. Prepare to be astonished by Eleni. By Eleni. When she's not reading Tolkien or teaching a class, she's doing yoga and toning up a PowerPoint presentation. For astronomer ambulation. And you do get adulation, okay. Eleni. You do get adulation. It's, it's good. It's you do. good. It doesn't get old. Oh, thank you. And neither do you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you look just as young as what you did six months ago, Eleni. Fantastic. What's the secret to your youthful looks? Astronomy. Jeans. Jeans, yeah. And uh, I drink very... lots of water. Yeah, you look fantastic for a 60-year-old. Thank you very much. I really hope I look like that when I'm 60 as well, but uh, it's the Mediterranean. It's the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> Probably. Too much olive oil. That's that's the trick. <laughs> Eleni, lots of love to you. Thank you so much for all of your hard Thank work. Thank you. Enjoy this break from teaching. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Um, bye Eleni. Bye. Ah. Mm, I'm on my own now. All sad. Apart from you lot in the chat room, you lot are wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Eleni. Happy Perseid hunting. Fabulous as always. I know, so good. So, so good. You put so much effort, as does Sonia. Right, I've got some bad news, everybody. Cosmo is absent. But that's not to say that he hasn't been active this week. Um, right, let us just... Um, oh, my gosh, so many tabs to press. Okay. In a minute, we're going to do the Cosmo game. But basically, he's elsewhere and it's so windy and I didn't realise that he was across the garden until right just before the show started. And it was so windy before I had to go out with a plastic bag over my head to protect my hair. And I thought, Cosmo, you're just going to have to take one for the team and not be on the show tonight. Thankfully, we've got this chap that I insist is called Gemini Jones, but Paul Sutherland insists is called Buzz Waldron. Maybe we could call him all four names. It's Gemini Jones, Buzz Waldron, everybody. Paul posted him to me and he's um, a, if you're interested, he's a pebble crochet made, I think, by ladies in Bangladesh. He's wearing a Science Kaylee um, Dancing for Science um, brooch, which came from Solar Sphere. And we had the fiddly tea and the dance caller had us all dancing around and swinging our partners like molecules and stars and stuff. Science Kaylee, excellent. And he's also wearing a British Antarctic Survey ic.uk badge with um i think a fairy penguin one of the little penguins on it he's broached up and he comes from the tate gallery somewhere so he's cosmo's stunt double this evening um okay so what we're going to do is read out three clues there's a slight twist in it this evening you have heard me correctly cosmo stroke buzz waldron's brain teaser coming shortly He's in flying around the solar system, or maybe a bit further. But to the casual observer, he's a mithering, pestering sloth. Where have you been to this week, Cosmo? Cosmo, where have you been? Three clues. Only answer after the clues. Cosmo over and out. Now, I know that some of you popular astronomers like to go off prematurely. We're going to put a stop to that tonight. This is, it's not really a fastest finger first. What it's supposed to be is to give people a couple of seconds. <laughs> it's not long, really, to assimilate the information that we're going to read out in a minute. Uh, because if you see the answer pop up too soon, it stops the brain cogs turning. And it's meant to be a little brain teaser. What banner should we have up? Um put it put that up there we go okay so i'm going to read out three cryptic clues as to where cosmo stroke buzz has been this week and then when i have read out the clues i don't care if you know the answer 
It's not about you showing off. It's about giving people's grey matter a workout. We're going to count down from 10. And after uh, the end of the countdown, me and Buzz, that is when you can answer. So we're going to have a buffer zone in between reading out the clues and when you can answer. So people's heads can go. And tick -tick -tick, the mechanisms swizzling around in your head. Are you ready? Okay. So, Buzz, where have you been this week? Gemini. Okay. Well, he's been very nearby this week. In stellar terms, at least. How far away were you? Yeah. He's been 4.24 light years away. And the final clue, and then I'm going to do the countdown. Don't answer yet. Otherwise, he will run out of air very quickly if you answer too soon. That's the forfeit tonight. The third clue is it's cold outside. There's no kind of atmosphere. Those three clues again. He's been very nearby this week in stellar terms, at least. He's been 4.24 light years away. It's cold outside. There's no kind of atmosphere. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Uh oh, stop the press. You did say that, Paul. I take it all back. I'll rechristen it. Two, one, answer the question. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I forgot. Oh, what a traitorous woman I am. I will only ever call him Buzz Waldron from this point forward. Where has he been? He's been very nearby in stellar terms, at least 4.24 light years away. It's cold outside. There's no kind of atmosphere. Ooh, okay. The answers are coming in. You lot are great. Proxima Centauri. Pluto, I'm afraid that's very wrong. Red Dwarf, Proxima Centauri. Oh, I, Marks and Spencers. Not this time. Not this time. Although sometimes he does go there. The answers are coming in. But the correct, precise one hasn't been on the screen yet. Uh, actually, it has. I'm sorry. Oh, God, there's multiple answers. I should oh, always get caught out here. I'd make a terrible egghead. I really would. Uh, can you see whether you can get the answer on my screen, though? The one cut and pasted from Wikipedia, please. Tim Crook has got it right. Oh, you've all got it right. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I'm getting thrown here because it's A, B or C. The answer is, oh, no, hang on a minute. Oh, I should have read it properly. I'm so sorry. He's been to Alpha Centauri C or Proxima Centauri. So it's two different names. I didn't realize that. It's a small red faint and red dwarf class M star, not visible to the naked eye. Proxima Centauri is the closer to the sun at the distance of 4.24 light years. Light years. Well done. You all got it right. And it's not been to Scotland. Although he might have been. You just never know where these little toys go to. Hey, everybody. Thank you. You all got it right. You all win a prize. The SPA will be mailing you your prize shortly, somewhere in the region of a £500 voucher to spend at an astronomy shop of your choice. Look out in your letterbox. That's a lie. Right, you popular astronomers. I think it's time to go. I think it's time to go. Uh, running a bit early this evening because um, Sonia is out looking at oh hang on i've got something to show you sonia has messaged me this you need to see popular astronomers sonia's already taken a beautiful picture of the moon oh no i've got a rainbow screen going on there well that's just not very pleasant to look at is it but that's sonia's crescent moon that is poor viewing experience it's a high proper motion star as well i'm glad it has proper motions so that means i guess that you can see track it moving yeah watch its parallax right let's have um let's have a quick look here thank you for your perseids memories um we'll see you next week we've not got a guest lined up for next week i'm thinking of moving the show by the way to tuesdays um sonia and um eleni have confirmed the powers that be at the spa have not because basically it's my pub quiz night. Uh, it's back on and it's the only night of the week I actually get out to see a group of humans in the face to face and breathe other people's viruses. <laughs> oh, yes. Good luck, everybody. If you're going to go out Perseid watching, you know what? It's brutal. 
Is that a red sunset? That's really weird. Right, okay. We can see a red sunset from Anglesey. Let's just have a quick check and see what the weather is going to do tomorrow because I'd rather stay up tomorrow than tonight. It's ultra, ultra windy here tonight. Look, the winds are in the black. That means it's strong. Oh, it's dying down a bit. Uh, mm, tomorrow's going to be quite nice. Then moving through into the evening, a bit more bobbins. Maybe tomorrow night, yeah. Maybe I'll get up. I'll set my alarm maybe for one o'clock and see what happens. Some clouds coming in. Hope they pass quickly. Because don't forget, it is the equivalent of astronomy Christmas, the Perseids, if you've got a good sky. Thank you to everybody who's joined in in the chat room. You've all been lovely. Hello to all our new viewers. You've all been so lovely. Thank you to Ian Ribpath with his obsolete constellations. Good night, Vicky and Ernie. Looking forward to seeing Sonia's photographs. Yeah. Cool show, Vicky. Thank you. I do feel very cool. I'm going to go and drink an alcohol-free beer now to celebrate. Oh, thank you. And I'm so sorry, Paul. I forgot that you said I could name him. Why didn't you tell me that two years ago? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The show needs a theme tune, actually. I'll have to write a theme tune. Oh, can somebody suggest a song, um, uh, uh, a song challenge for me, please? Au revoir. Um, like my space night. What you can't see is I could get into trouble for doing this. I am wearing a pair of amazing hot pants and I've been to the beauty salon today and had, uh, can I get my foot up? And had a most wonderful pedicure. That's not a very nice thing. I can't turn my toes around. I've got incredible spangly pink nail varnish on. I've had a beautiful leg massage uh, and all my legs done. Um, and I am wearing basically the best ever hot pants but you'd have to tune back in after after the watershed to see the hot pants that are rocking this outfit now. But rest assured, they are hot. <laughs> it's the only astronomy show in the world presented by a presenter in hot pants. Um, that was fun. It was wonderful to have you, my Randa Nautica and me. So uh, let's go. Wrap up warm. Don't wear hot pants to view the Perseids, kids. Uh, and we'll see you next week. It's already after 9 p.m. Well, you can you can see. Let me just make sure they're decent. There you go. Look, a bit of thigh, a bit of hot pant going on. There we go. They're good. They're good. My uh, When I used to be a DJ, a uh, uh, party DJ, my DJ name was DJ Hot Pants. <laughs> I found an old flyer from about 10 years ago, uh, which um, I... <laughs> The highlight of my DJ career, because uh, I obviously didn't get very far with it, was I went into uh, the bar one night and um, they'd put uh, my flyer up on the back of the toilet door. DJ Hot Pants. <laughs> it's been lovely to have you along. Thank you, everybody. Bye. I don't want to go. Thank you. Yes, it's after 9pm. You'll just have to imagine the Hot Pants excellence. Oh, Hot Pants, Vicky. Yay. See you all soon. Bye. Mwah. <laughs>